Hi, this is Pamela Wirsch from the Encourage Your Wellness Podcast. And today I have Dr. Heather Tallman Room. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. All right. So, Doctor, you're a board certified family physician. You focus on whole body health and patient education. Uh, you have worked with a number of ages and a number of diagnoses, and would love to hear more about your journey and some of the things that you're really focused on right now. Okay, wonderful. Yes, I'm a family physician by training. I was trained in a conventional Western style for medicine. I went to the University of New Mexico School of Medicine and <clears throat> always had an interest in kind of the whole person and nutrition, exercise, how to optimize health, you know, for anybody of any 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 age really and uh <clears throat> when i got through medical school uh, i loved medical school it was a wonderful experience learning about how the body works the you know the incredible magnitude of what our body can do at a cellular level at a biochemical level you know physiology anatomy it was just amazing to learn about how the body worked and then uh, transitioning into residency or into the clinical phase uh, it felt like we got a little bit more away from some of that, you know, from what made the body so amazing and wonderful and a little more in the direction of findings, uh, diagnoses and using codes for those diagnoses and using kind of a prescription for those diagnoses or a very more regimented approach to prevention that uh, didn't leave a lot of room for, you know, bioindividuality. And also I, I didn't, it kind of strayed away from my original passion for nutrition and, and whole body health in a way. So that kind of longing for that part of medicine, even before I got into medicine, um, some will ask that why my crazy journey took me to a master's in public policy before I went into medicine. It's because I was interested in health, kind of global health, right, too. Um, but that path kind of away from those roots of thing of interest um, left a longing. And that longing started to be fulfilled um, early on when I went to work at the Whitaker Wellness Institute in California. And there I was, it was kind of, you know, full immersion um, working in an environment where there was not an emphasis on drugs or surgery. And in fact, there was an emphasis on helping bodies heal from whatever ailments without the heavy use of, of drugs and surgery to get there. So really much more in line with the compatibility of using the natural capability of the human body to resolve issues with the right supports and by removing the obstacles from healing. So fast forward, I've worked at quite a few, in quite a few different environments of integrative, holistic, bioregulatory, integrative, functional, you know, whatever the, <laughs> the popular word is today for looking at the whole person, looking through the lens of bioindividuality, collaborating with practitioners from a very broad range of um, perspectives, modalities, so very transdisciplinary teams um, of individuals, be they teams in a one environment like they were at the Whitaker Wellness Institute or across a region or throughout town. But um, so I've both been in my own private practice where I hung my shingle and it's kind of the only show there to Right now, I work at the New Hampshire Health and Wellness Center, and that's a collection, like a well, almost like a co-op uh, collection of practitioners um, that work in that same space of healing, using lots of different modalities, but working both independently and then cross-referring. You're probably... Yeah, Learn so, about me more from a different line of work. <laughs> yeah, so so what does that mean? So what what types of people come to you? What what are they trying to look for? What, what kind of tests do you like to run? What are you thinking as as you're meeting with people? All right, so that's a good question, and and I think the answer is a lot of different. I, I don't really follow a particular protocol. I see patients as fairly young. I don't do 
typically primary care in the sense that I I consider myself more adjunctive to somebody's primary care. So I'm no longer delivering babies or um, doing newborn checks and that kind of thing. Um, or working on the other end, like in hospice or in the hospital setting. It's more people coming to me and coming to this practice who have all types of conditions, but are looking for a means of doing what they can to nurture their their health in some way. So they may be getting conventional treatment someplace um, and then want to have look at say their nutrition and their lifestyle or what might be underlying their condition that they haven't looked at yet. So they're, they've gotten the idea of root cause or what you think of as functional medicine. So I would say if you look at our clinic in particular, it is primarily adult medicine, but I see children, I see all ages. Um, and so do my, most of my colleagues, maybe not all. So there are naturopaths, acupuncturists, um, hands-on Reiki, massage, craniosacral, doing sound therapy, um, a whole range of things. So as far as having, navigating what's best for a patient that walks through my office, it's really a lot of the history. Looking for patterns in presentation, in illness, in interventions, and starting to sort out what what comes up as like their priorities so that might look like um, somebody has an inf a heavy amount of inflammation it may look like they i may suspect a hidden infection i may suspect that they um, could use something much more nuanced for their like say genetic makeup you know, if I see certain things like in a family um, and that isn't to say looking for a gross genetic anomaly that is looking across what your listeners probably know of as SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms or genomics to see where they vary slightly from other people in society and where they might biohack to use that term um, their health based on their individuality so the type of testing i do i don't usually rely on a lot of heavy testing up front um, there are practitioners who do and i respect that and they're very good at the nuanced interpretation of those tests because even if you take a standard lab test which i will not infrequently order maybe uh, CBC, a complete, you know, complete blood count, a complete metabolic panel, um, thyroid tests, maybe certain vitamins, and knowing just enough to perhaps test it slightly differently. Like I might not look at magnesium. I wouldn't write on my re requisition magnesium. I'd write red blood cell magnesium because to me that's more clinically appropriate or what's kind of exp explains to me what's happening in the tissue with magnesium, not just what's uh, what's in the serum you know, or the plasma. So that's helpful to fine tune standard labs. Sometimes that's what's accessible for patients. Um, if it's an insurance issue or if it's a small child, you know, sometimes collecting a lot of labs is very inconvenient. Um, that isn't to say it can't be helpful. So it probably gets me into describing more the kind of work I'm doing with another organization that you're probably very familiar with, um, which is Epidemic Answers. And so my one hat is that I work in a clinic, which I have for many years, um, various clinics, and that's my own private practice. It's part time. Um, for the rest of the time, I am working with an organization called Epidemic Answers. It's a nonprofit that serves parents and practitioners in with resources to help navigate chronic illness or to keep their already healthy children healthy or, or make them healthier. Uh, so that drew my attention many years ago when the director of that organization, Beth Lambert, wrote, I think, her first book, which was A Compromised Generation, looking into what is happening with our children today. And 
as I read her book, I said, oh, this make, this is right in keeping with everything I've learned from a holistic functional approach and the, the various individuals I've been listening to over time, whether it was from A4M, which was one of the early, you know, forms of kind of medical communities that looked at uh, what was happening from a physiologic standpoint, from a total load standpoint, you know, what's weighing on people's health today. Um, to the more modern um, practitioners that really moved the biological approach to autism forward. So that was, she was speaking about our children in the way, in the same way I was learning about what's helpful, what seems to be harmful, and really looking at that, what we call a total load perspective now. So her book, I think she wrote about 10 years ago, and I was always kind of an advisor in the you know, in the wings waiting for this kind of project to take place where uh, they were developing the research capacity to study scientifically, you know, what is it that's burdening our children globally? You know, what what are all the things, if we looked at all the total load on our children today, what things are most impactful? What things, you know, are most impactful under certain conditions? What things are most impactful for, for children being healthy? And then, so they created a, a research project around that. And I was I was there to advise when time was appropriate, as well as a prospective study. So the first is, uh, well, there are two studies. Do you mind me telling about it? Oh, no, please. And I mean, but, frankly, I the work done at Epidemic Answers has been um, life-changing in my family because mm -hmm. it's not just one thing that you have a symptom from. There's a bunch of things that pissed off your body, for lack of a better word. Okay. And now you've got to figure out how to calm it down. And you can't just calm it down with one thing. And so that's really the interesting thing about about the work being done at Epidemic Answers and the insight that has been done in the written works and the research, really explaining in layman's terms how this can impact this, this can impact this, and how all of it together then creates these massive diagnoses. So yes, please. Right. The perfect storm, as it were, right, for your child under, and, and when you look at that kind of tip of the iceberg, which often comes to a parent in the form of a diagnosis that's completely overwhelming, right, um, but sometimes comes forth in different symptomatology, then under that iceberg is, you know, a lot of other things that maybe that the body, the physiology is trying to navigate under the sea of kind of total load. So that is extremely appealing to me that we're, you know, we're not looking at a smoking gun as the source of all evil, right? It's like, what are all the things that are contributing today to the health of our children? So that has manifested in two research studies, two IRB approved research studies, one being a broad, broad survey over a thousand questions for parents to fill out uh, if they have a child between the age of one and 15. That takes a deep dive into everything that they've either been exposed to, um, that's a current part of their life and their diet or their family or their history, um, and takes all of that into account and then generates a report that shows um, from the literature what things, you know, whether they had a C-section or whether they were breastfed and how long, you know, just every detail about the, their, their house and where it's located <laughs> and uh, every detail you can imagine and then starts to sort out which things um, are rise to the top in different conditions. So that's been a really interesting part of the research. And the other research is a prospective study uh, working with live children, not that the children aren't live for the CHIRP study, but children in real time um, to take them from or follow their journey from kind of the onset or early stages of a chronic illness to a uh, 18 month course of time wherein someone or a collection of multidisciplinary team of individuals are working with that child to see progress toward recovery. So I came into play in a more active way a few years ago when it when the research moved into that dimension and they needed a medical director in the context of that working as for the research as research people facilitating this this process we're not acting as the clinicians but we're facilitating the work of a multidisciplinary team of clinicians supporting this child and then the family's uh, input and the family's uh, contribution to the narrative about what's happening with their child. 
both from a lab standpoint as, you know, various assessments and, and various, um, both written assessments and then assessments from specialists, say somebody that understands reflexes, somebody that understands that the neurooptometry, that the brain and the eyeball are one and the same, and that you can study the innards of the brain through the eyeball. And then you can also work on healing that that body through the eye or, you know, correcting vision in certain ways. So um, different groups that use their skill at understanding how something is functioning to see how what's happening internally to the, with that child as well and then navigating that and improving it so kind of in a in a summary simplified way I kind of think of it like Goldilocks medicine right <laughs> looking for just right so as you look at the total load you're saying what kind of things are weighing heavily you know what kind of things are contributing to that stuck place of an individual or dysfunction um, and then where is there not enough support? So how can we lower the load on the child and raise the supports, maybe very uniquely specific to them? And sometimes that requires some testing or maybe a facility with interpreting body language, you know, like, like you may look at someone's fingernails and see lots of white spots and think, oh, they probably have a zinc deficiency. So you can use that and employ things that are not offensive um, to the child or use something more subtle like homeopathy or energy work of some sort to give you feedback and then to offer some kind of guidance as to what might lower the load, what might raise the supports. And then where you see that something has been really derailed, mm -hmm. um, I can put you know, lower, let's say someone moves out of a moldy house. That's, that's a real lowering of a load that could have been contributing to their health. Um, and we give lots of nutritional supports, but maybe something got derailed. Maybe their reflexes were uh, thrown back into more of a primitive state, just like they might with a stroke, right? <laughs> so then you work with somebody who helps those reflexes move along so that they get brought back up to speed or helps that joint get realigned you know in a way a chiropractor might realign the spine so there may be some skilled people that I would refer out to especially in my practice or but also as we would with the documenting hope which is the name the overarching name for the two studies um, because we're documenting everything that we research um, that should culminate in a film a documentary um, and case reports along the way and that kind of thing um, but that it's really, um, as I see the kind of role of the functional integrative holistic type practitioner, it's doing what we know how to do to help the family or the individual lower the, the barriers to healing, to raise the supports, and then to find if we aren't the ones that provide that particular technique or tool, someone who we know is skilled at doing that particular piece that we we aren't skilled in. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the example of moving out of the moldy house is certainly a good one. Do you have, have you found other, like in, in, in our experience, removing gluten and sugar made a huge difference in terms of overall health and wellness. Do you have things that you have found, um, to make a big difference, um, or some, some themes that you have found over the, over the years that you say, Hey, you know, um, if you want to test this or if you want to try removing this or try or, you know, anything in the lifestyle, anything in particular. Yeah, I think uh, there are numerous of those, some of them coming out of the study that we're seeing, you know, that kind of percolate to the top, like antibiotic use, you know, the high amount of antibiotic use. So finding alternatives to antibiotic use when it's possible or, uh, you know, teaching our doctors to, to know more about, interventions that are that are effective but don't involve antibiotics um, for the early stages so that the infection can't get to the point where we feel compelled to have to use an antibiotic so minimizing that can matter i i'll give some examples of maybe stories that come to mind um i 
remember once having a young child, I think they were close to three, with very limited utterance of anything that was notable as far as, you know, recognizable. And that family was working hard to, with speech therapy, trying to get the child to say like mom, mom, dad, or something, you know, that was tangible. And I know, cause they set this, they had months in a few months, it was going to be mother's day. Let's, let's hope, you know, shoot for mama. <laughs> you know. And just by taking an extensive history and learning about that little child's likes and dislikes and propensities and dietary practices and probably some of the manifestations physically probably had to do with, I'm guessing, I don't remember now, but like ear infections or propensity for that, or maybe some skin things. I felt like this child is likely not doing well with dairy. Now, I don't think dairy is wrong for all people, but for this particular child, there were enough patterns that indicated to me maybe dairy was a problem that I said, let's start there. Let's start with something relatively simply, although he loves his milk. Um, if we can back off from milk, oftentimes you do, you crave that thing that may not be your best friend, right? <laughs> Whether it be gluten or dairy or soy or something else. Um, and so I said, just give me a call back in a few weeks um, and you don't need to come in, but at least give me an update on where you are with that. And then we can, you know, reassess. So I saw them on my schedule and I was surprised. And the mother said, I know you told me to just give you a call first, but I wanted to show you our child. Sometimes we want to give him a glass of milk to shut him up. Like for that particular child, it was the unleashing of his language, access to language. Now, I wish that it were that easy for every child that isn't speaking, but for that child, it was. So it isn't always a fancy, complex underlying genetic <laughs> dysmorphology that's creating the problem that is you know the the proverbial straw that's breaking that camel's back there could have been various straws along the way but maybe that one in the context of the other insults was the thing that 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 body couldn't handle concurrently or that inflamed it so much or flared things so badly that structurally and functionally that child couldn't act you know couldn't function um so i've had um i'll give an example of of using kind of an energy mind to determine kind of what might be helpful for a child so sometimes even putting that kind of product that might be beneficial in the presence of the individual right rather than even consuming it and seeing what happens but just in the presence of that. And you can do that maybe to more of a degree with like, say, homeopathic, so that are pretty much energy anyway, because they're not really substantive. And I had a little guy who had a, a chronic um, congenital Lyme and didn't communicate very well and, and was kind of walking. At, I wanted him to just hold something. And it was, in this case, it was a, called, they're called gemos. They're made from the the buds of plants. So there is actually some substance, you know, it's kind of like essential oils where you could smell it or whatever, but you could act, there's actually a little substance in there, but I was using little vials of this and, and I, I had the little guy hold them and I, I was just observing him and his mother was trying to get him to cooperate. And he was walking around the room, rolling his eyes and giggling and not, you know, not really paying attention to my request to like hold that, you know, but he was, he was holding it and walking around. And then I, I, I held one, which happens to be fig, which is very good for calming the nervous system. And for those of us that are stuck in fight or flight, right, which you could imagine a child with congenital Lyme who was being treated by experts beyond my level of expertise at the time um, and making progress on various ways, but also some neurologic challenges still. And um that that would be calming, that that fig might be calming to some system like that. But he had no idea what I was offering and he just kept wandering around in circles. And then when I handed that particular one, um, cause I had some others in mind as well. Um, he laid down on my clinic table and I thought, well, that's interesting. The mom said, well, what was that? And I said, I don't know. Let's, why don't you get back up and we'll, you know, let's do some more. So we kept handing him blindly. Everybody's blind to it. Um, except I know there's a pile of them. I handed him, that one in the mix of others, but it wasn't until I handed him that one again, he laid on the clinic table in fetal position and looked up at me and said, I love you. 
Now, that's compelling to me that maybe that would help him. And, and in fact, it, it was very helpful to him. Um, so that's kind of the extremes of like as simple as taking away dairy or as kind of nuanced as letting their energetic body communicate to you because he couldn't verbally do so to say, you know, this is helpful. Um, there are plenty of examples of people um, letting go of gluten and experiencing big shifts in their health. Um, letting go of dairy, letting go of soy, letting go of those foods that are genetically modified such that we can spray them with a chemical that actually um, causes harm to our own ecosystem. So everybody knows modern times now that we have a biofilm and we have a microbiome. So we have a, a living engaged system in our ecosystem in our mucosa, right? Whether it's your nose or your gut, primarily your gut. And that that interfaces with our nervous system and the way our mind works. And so oftentimes it's the things that help heal that microbiome and heal the lining and integrity of the intestinal tract um, that we can see often profound shifts in people's bowels, in people's um, energy level in people's cognition, even in people's uh, foggy brains being right, you know, whatever, losing the foggy brain, um, through dropping those things that are modified for and or sprayed by chemicals. And for your listeners are probably savvy on this and maybe some aren't, but we use chemicals in agriculture or people use chemicals in agriculture to, in kind of similar ways to antibiotics. So whether the antibiotic is coming to you via the plant or the food off the shelf, or whether it's coming to you as a prescription, it's coming to you in a way that is having some impact on your, your microbiome, your ecosystem, and rendering it potentially incapable of doing playing its role for you. So if you look at the microbiome, and I'm sure you've had probably people on your podcast on this topic, you know, if you look at the, the ecosystem, we have, you know, as a humans, we have 10 to the 13th, say, human cells, roughly. And we have 10 times that number of organisms in our gut, bacteria, probably 10 times that. So 10 with 13 zeros, human cells, 10 with 14 zeros, uh, bacterium, 10 with 15 zeros probably are more virus that are coexistent and probably have roles in our body, right? And so if we kind of randomly wipe them out with things that are designed to take them out, then we might be taking out with them those jobs that those that ecosystem had in your body. So we don't really survive and thrive without that ecosystem. Um, they've done research on animals where they stripped the whole gut lining of any kind of ecosystem and they lose capacity to do things like and make immune cells. Um, one of the important things that people are now aware of are your neurotransmitters, your serotonin, your dopamine, your oxytocin, feel good ones, right? And then too many or over an abundance of maybe the excitatory ones that make us stressed and panic and that kind of thing. Well, those that microbiome that ecosystem is part of what is your or it is the manufacturing place for many of those i mean i think it's so the many percent for many of these isn't it right right so the gut you know is the source of you know is most of your immune system is most of your nervous system it's a much larger nervous system than the brain and the spinal column that is the nervous system that is called the enteric nervous system of your gut so the interface, you know, what is the brain? Where is it? <laughs> is up for debate. You know, some people call the gut your second brain. I, I don't know, maybe it's the first, right? This one just walks around and helps us get into trouble, right? <laughs> um, but, I'm, you know, joking aside, if that ecosystem is what is interfacing with our immune system, interfacing with our knee, nervous system, is manufacturing B vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin K, um, be uh, just like if we when we take when we it's kind of like you know removing half your employees and then still expecting the factory to produce right 
So I don't know if that was a roundabout way of ask, answering your question about like kind of what things do I see change people's health? I see often dramatic things with dietary changes. And that's usually where I start, which is probably because of my passion for nutrition and concern for hunger in the world, which got my attention at a young age. You know, there are a lot of children suffering from hunger in the world and we have enough to eat. And then I started to learn more about what we were eating. And, and then I realized we have a lot of hungry children that are well-fed, but not well-fed <laughs> that get plenty to eat, but don't get the nutrition they need. And in fact, get anti-nutrition or things that are actually harming their ability to access the nutrition or the limited nutrition that's there. Um, so nutrition, gut health are always very high on my level of interest. That being said, the, the spectrum of which you can look at one's health um, is so diverse. Um, people are familiar with the ACEs or the, the childhood traumas and how they impact other things. When I was in medical school, I did a my thesis in medical school on trauma and comorbidity. So it was actually looking at a large number of cases from a, um, a psychiatrist um, back East who'd collected a lot of data on a lot of patients and looking at kind of psychological and other health issues and what they came to the doctor for. And then their, ex their exposure to trauma personally, or even witnessing trauma and how that, impacted their comorbidities. So that was before the ACEs study, but it's consistent with that. So you cannot disregard trauma as a player in outcomes of health either. And so sometimes those trauma involve relationships that need healing, involve the one's capacity to solve a problem physiologically from a way that they don't have access. Let me reword that a little bit. I'll put it into a slightly different context. If, if you, if you, if you describe the body, mind and spirit as having one job, it would be to protect itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stay alive. Right? So when we don't, when we lack, the tools for staying alive, the body will then employ whatever it can under the circumstances based on the resources available, based on the example set for it, based on um, experiences to date. You know, your body with its level of resources and wisdom will try to solve that problem for you at a cellular level, at an emotional level, at a spiritual level. It'll try to fill that void or correct that thing that is that is putting it at perceived risk yeah that, that's a good point is there anything that you want to make sure that people take away from today um any place that you want them to go visit to read to learn more about health and wellness well i'll put the plug in for epidemic answers because i think it has been 10 years of collecting a library of resources for parents and practitioners to navigate all forms of modern chronic illness and symptomatology and diagnoses, kind of like a checklist um, of things one could look at for different diagnoses, for example, you know, from ADHD to Alzheimer's, really. Um, and so that can give you, start to give you those insights. We will have that CHIRP survey available for people in the near future. We're switching platforms right now, which is a very laborious task um, because the platform we had it on uh, shut down is no longer available. It was based on what's called the living matrix that was a functional medicine approach to capturing everybody's not just total load, but chronology, you know, chronologic history. So we will have that available and you can become part of science and you can learn from that because you will get a, a report back about your children. And so we would love and invite people to join in with that. Um, there's no cost of taking it and you get a report back that can help you think differently or maybe navigate your child's illness differently or think about all the things that might be contributing in the total load. 
Um, also, just like I said, there's a library of resources there, though. There are webinars from specialists and you name it from all different categories over the course of 10 years. And thematically, you can look into things that you might not know a lot about yet or that might help you kind of in a whole continuum of things you can do that are free to things that you can do that maybe would cost more like moving out of a moldy house, right? You know, so it doesn't give you the resources to do that, but it gives you the mental resources and also the encouragement that I think most of us need today and is that we're not alone. So we also have a program called Healing Together for Parents Navigating Difficult Situations with Their Children where parents can come together in community in a membership and discuss that and discuss that with not only practitioners, but amongst themselves and share supports and, and encouragement. Um, because it's a very lonely journey, as you may have experienced, at least usually at the outset of kind of encountering what your your biggest fear of that maybe something's not working for your child um, and maybe not working in a scary big way that sounds so permanent and overwhelming. Um, so we have resources for parents. We have resources for children. And I would say that even though it's child centric, it would pertain to everybody. I once, when I got into the realm of, um, researching and understanding autism in particular, like trying to navigate what that meant as people were coming to my office for the first time, I didn't learn about that really in medical school. Um, and then got in with the, like the cutting edge individuals that were studying the biology and the biomedical approach. Um, once I kind of entered that realm, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the model to understand all illness, really. It's like the Petri dish. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find anything new that hasn't been kind of looked at in that context for any age or any diagnosis, because there's an overlap. It's looking at that what is, like you said, the total load? What is it that's the perfect storm today? Well, good. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate having you on today. Thank you for your time. <laughs>